Well, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It's good to be with you. It's March Madness, right? So let me tell you a story. My boyhood hero was Coach John Wooden, who many of you recognize that name. And he won 10 championships in 12 years, which is unheard of. It'll never happen again, uh, in my opinion. Uh, and every season on the first day of practice, he would come into the dressing room and do the exact same thing without fail. He would come in with a box of high top shoes and two pairs of tube socks. <coughs> and he would sit down and he would say, okay, gentlemen, here's how we're going to put our socks on. And he would slowly and methodically, with his bare feet, show them how to put on two pairs of socks. And then he would show them how to put their shoes on and lace them up very meticulously. Now you can imagine these are players that have been playing for 10 or 15 years at least. <coughs> It had quite a career already to be able to play for UCLA, where he was. But yet, what he was trying to get across to them is that it's about the fundamentals. And even before every big game, he would spend the entire practice working on dribbling and passing and shooting layups on the fundamentals. He wouldn't talk about the other team's scouting report. It was always about the fundamentals with him. And he was, the, by the way, the most winning coach in college basketball history. In fact, I think his alma mater is probably the favorite. There's a little tip there on your brackets. It's a little too late now, though, isn't it? But I think they might even win it this year. Well, he would tell them, the reason I did that is because by doing the small things right, it allows the great things to come about. And so that's what we're trying to do with the old school. As uh, Jody mentioned, I, I wrote my fourth book. I spent half of my life in the financial services industry. But then for the, for the last four years, I've been kind of on a quest to figure out a way to pour into this generation because I've got four millennials. They're going to have to deal with this world most likely much longer than I will have to. And so I wrote The Old School Advantage for my four children. My publisher liked it enough that she said, let's get it out to the general public. And so that's what we've done. But this is... Uh, really the, what is, the courses that we teach are predicated on the principles that we've brought back from the centuries uh, into this day and time. And there are things, I'll give you a few examples in just a moment, but they're, they're those ideas and concepts that we all were probably taught organically, I say, by observation with our parents and our grandparents. But this generation is not getting that. And the reason they're not getting that is because of these rectangles that we're surrounded by. We live in the age of distraction. And so what can we do to bring them back into focus, into those values and principles and concepts that will help them get uh, beyond their peers in this day and age? We're trying to uh, create a generation that can be described uh, in this manner. I'm authentic and consistent <coughs> in my actions. I am responsible, accountable, and reliable. I am determined and I make no excuses. I am wise beyond my years. I am old school. That's what old school means to us. And so there, there are three overarching principles uh, that we teach. And the first one is that it's not just what you do, it's who you are that matters. And so think about who we are. We are the people we meet and the books we read. That's a quote by Charles Tremendous Jones, who's since passed away. But if that's the case, how can we interact with our fellow human beings in such a way that we're seen wise, or beyond, our, wise beyond our years, especially if we're in the millennial or the Gen X or the soon to come up to adulthood, the Gen Z generation? A couple of ways. Building rapport instantly. We have a technique we call lava. We call it that because it warms up a conversation and gets it flowing. But the idea here is the first thing we typically ask someone when we meet them is, what? What do you do? Well, I just said it's not what you do so much as it is who you are, because out of who you are comes what you do. And so by simply not asking what do you do, but rather are you from this area originally, you begin to establish a rapport with somebody because people love to talk about where they're from usually, right? Uh, so these are just simple things. I wish I had time to go through the entire technique with you. Uh, but these are things, how to build instant rapport with someone, with anyone, anywhere, at any time. That would be a very valuable tool for this generation. 
Another one is to use what we call words that wow. If this generation has any problem, it's with their words. You saw in the video there, we were, talking, we were kind of teasing about the word awesome. <coughs> when the word awesome is overused, the word awesome means nothing, right? We're, we're guilty of that. I bet some of us in here, certainly our kids are. You hear it all the time. Like. Yeah, I see some eyes rolling here. So. I have a problem with so sometimes. These are words that we need to scrub out of this generation's vocabulary and then upgrade their vocabulary. So instead of awesome, what if they use the word exceptional or extraordinary? Can you imagine a young man or young woman standing there and, and you, you tell them something they think is really good or nice and instead of saying awesome, they say, that's exceptional, that's extraordinary. It's almost arresting when you hear a young person use those kinds of words. And so that's another thing that we're trying to, to ingrain in the thinking of this generation. Just another uh, example. Uh, and then a common courtesy that has almost died out. I, I tell the millennials, if you'll do this one thing every day for the rest of your career, you cannot fail. Now that's a pretty, that's a pretty bold statement, but I believe it. And that is, if you will send one handwritten note to someone every day for the rest of your life, you can't fail. Do you believe that? How rare are handwritten notes today? I was talking to a Fortune 500 HR director uh, about a year ago, and, I, and if you're a Fortune 500 HR director, you've interviewed a few people in your career. And I asked her, how many after the interview sent you a handwritten note? to say thank you. And to my surprise and shock, she said three people in her entire career. And then I just continued the survey and I said, uh, how many of those got the job? And guess how many got the job? Three. Now that's not scientific evidence. That's completely <laughs> anecdotal. They had other qualities to get that job. But <coughs> the point is, if we can teach them to do that. So we in detail teach them how to do that in our workshops. I like to use brown ink, by the way, because nobody else uses brown ink. And where do you find brown ink? What famous documents might you find brown ink on? How about our founding documents, right? The second idea is, is simple, lifelong learning. If someone in this generation, millennials, can become a lifelong learner, again, I tell people, if you can read one book a month that you're not required to read, there's no stopping you. You're going to be successful in your career. If you want to really go out on a limb and read two books a month or about 25 books a year, you'll be the CEO somewhere one day. That's how important reading is. <coughs> leaders are readers, and readers become leaders. And kids nowadays don't read. Uh, the average American reads 0.4 books a year. And only 44% uh, of Americans did not buy one book last year. And so that trend, it, it, could you see that if someone from this generation decided to embrace these old school principles, how it would set them apart and above the others in their generation? And so that's what we're hoping uh, that will happen. Uh, and then uh, lastly, I would say perseverance is uh, the next most or the, the third overarching theme that we have uh, within the old school. And I use a, a, a challenge coin to illustrate that. And uh, if you've been given a challenge coin, maybe from a police officer or a firefighter or perhaps a military, uh, military personnel, I collect them and I get them often. Uh, so this one isn't meant to be of that standing, uh, but it's just an idea to get a concept across. Our challenge coin, the old school challenge coin, actually says the word challenge on it. Uh, so maybe that's the only one in the world that says challenge on it. But on the other side, it says opportunity. And so that third concept is this. Every challenge creates an equal or greater opportunity. Now think about that for a second. If you could live your life in that way, every challenge creates an equal or greater opportunity. And so on one side of the coin, it says challenge. And on the other side, it says opportunity. And so if you flip this coin of life, so to speak, and it comes up opportunity, you have an opportunity. You walk through that door and you see what happens. If it comes up challenge, as it often does, what do you have? You have an opportunity. So you are playing the game of life, in this metaphor, with a two-sided coin. No matter what happens, you keep moving forward and you persevere 
and things will work out. That is a concept in an everybody gets a trophy kind of generation we've raised. That is a concept that we believe at the old school needs to be put forth and espoused at every opportunity that we, that we have. Are there any uh, police officers in, in the room? Right? Firefighters or? All right, so you get the challenge. Good. Thank you for your service. Thank you, sir. Yeah, there you go. Thank you. Okay, yeah, my pleasure. And then um, finally, I have a baton up here. We have another video we didn't show you here, but uh, just due to time. But <clears throat> the idea here is that one generation is actually passing the baton to the next generation. So think about this. If, if you told your grandson or granddaughter an old school principle, so you're teaching them wisdom, and then they teach that to their child, and then their child decides not to pass that information on to the next generation. So your great, great grandchild decides they're not going to pass that wisdom on. The wisdom you passed on that your grandchild cooperated in at least gave to his or her kids, your wisdom, what you taught your grandchild, will last 150 years. So what is the world going to be like 150 years from now? We shudder to think, don't we? But that's the idea that we need to pass on these principles to the next generation. We need to pass the baton uh, to them. And so that's what we at the old school are, are doing our best to facilitate that mission.